In this video, I'll be discussing the main categories of IV fluids. By the end of the video, you will be able to list the categories of IV fluids and several examples of each. You'll be able to describe the constituents of common IV fluids. And last, you'll be able to list their primary indications, contraindications, and side effects. Let's start with the main categories of fluids. Although most people simplify the discussion and focus on just two categories, crystalloid and colloid, to be complete, I'm going to list all four. By far the most commonly used category is what is referred to as crystalloid fluid. These are electrolyte solutions which have a relatively low tendency to stay intravascular. Common examples include something called normal saline. There is half normal saline, which literally has a concentration of 50% that of normal saline. There is the commonly used maintenance fluid D5 half normal saline plus 20 mole equivalents per liter of potassium chloride. And last, a somewhat more complex solution called lactated ringers. The next category is colloid, which has a relatively high tendency to stay intravascular. Examples here include solutions of the naturally occurring protein albumin and fresh frozen plasma, which is comprised of plasma proteins extracted from blood donations and typically used to correct coagulopathies. There are also synthetic colloids, which consist of manufactured macromolecules such as dextran and something called hydroxyethyl starch. Another category of fluids is electrolyte free water. We never infuse pure water since that causes hemolysis as shown in the previous video. Instead, this category includes various concentrations of sugar water, commonly referred to as D5W and D10W. Because electrolyte-free water fully distributes to all three fluid compartments, it's a terrible choice to expand intravascular volume and instead is only used in situations of persistent hypoglycemia or to quickly bring down serum osmolarity when it is critically elevated. The last category of IV fluids is blood, such as packed red blood cells, which is only used to treat severe anemia. I occasionally hear people refer to packed red blood cells as a colloid fluid, but that's not exactly accurate and it's better to think of it as a distinct category. The rest of this video is going to be focused on just the first two categories, uh, crystalloid and colloids. To understand the different types of crystalloid, you first need to know what is in normal plasma. Remember that plasma is the extracellular liquid portion of blood in which the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are carried. When it comes to IV fluids, the most relevant constituents of plasma are as follows. Sodium, which is normally around 140 mole equivalents per liter. Chloride, which is normally around 100 mole equivalents per liter. Potassium at around 4 mole equivalents per liter. A calcium at around 2.4 mole equivalents per liter, which may or may not be the units you're used to seeing with calcium, and glucose at about 0.85 grams per deciliter, though when reported by labs in the U.S., it is usually done so in units of milligrams per deciliter, in which case it would be 85. As you likely know, plasma also has an important anionic buffer to help maintain pH in a physiologic range in which most enzymes have optimal activity, that buffer is bicarbonate, which is usually around 24 milliequivalents per liter. And when all of the osmotically active constituents of plasma are added together, including others not listed here, it gives a total osmolarity of around 290 milliosmoles per liter. When I talk about IV fluids in comparison to normal plasma, I'll also be discussing their tonicity relative to plasma as well as typical indications which are not relevant here. The most elementary, so to speak, of IV fluids is 0.9% saline, frequently referred to as, quote, normal saline, or NS for short. The 0.9% refers to the fact that it's composed of 9 grams of sodium chloride dissolved in 1 liter of water. With a little bit of high school chemistry, you could work out that 0.9% saline must have in it 154 milliequivalents per liter of sodium and 154 milliequivalents per liter of chloride. There is no potassium, no calcium, no glucose, and no buffer. The predicted osmolarity of normal saline is simply 154 plus 154, or 308, which is typically given in units of milliosmoles per liter. Normal saline is usually referred to as an isotonic fluid, 
meaning that when infused, it has no effect on intracellular volume because its effective osmolarity is the same as that within the cells. Occasionally, you'll come across an intern who's trying to look smart on rounds and who points out that 308 is higher than 290, so normal saline is actually slightly hypertonic, and thus my quotation marks around isotonic. However, the resident, who is really smart, might correctly remark that saline does not act like an ideal solution, and its empirically measured osmolarity is actually quite a bit closer to plasma than one might initially assume from simply adding together the osmolarities of sodium and chloride together. Regarding the typical indication for normal saline, it's resuscitation. In other words, replacement of volume in a patient who is hypovolemic from sepsis, hemorrhage, or GI fluid loss. I'll be discussing whether or not this is an appropriate indication for normal saline in the next video of this series, which will be on IV fluids used for resuscitation. The next crystalloid to mention is 0.45% saline, predictably called half normal saline or half NS. This has 77 milliequivalents per liter of sodium and chloride and a predicted osmolarity of 154. 154 is substantially lower than the 290 milliosmoles per liter of plasma, so this is a hypotonic fluid. As we saw in the last video, bolusing hypotonic fluid can induce hemolysis as well as rapid and dangerous drops in plasma osmolarity. Therefore, half normal saline is not used for quick resuscitation, but rather for maintenance. Maintenance fluids are those used to replace ongoing physiologic fluid losses, such as urine production, roughly in real time. They will be the topic of the fourth video in this series. Yet another crystalloid is 3% saline. This contains 513 milliequivalents per liter of both sodium and chloride, and still no potassium, calcium, glucose, or buffer. 3% saline is dramatically hypertonic. Although you might predict such a hypertonic fluid might be great for rapid intravascular volume expansion and shock, it is rarely used for this indication and is more often used to manage severe and life-threatening hyponatremia in which it can rapidly increase plasma osmolarity. Next is D5 half NS plus 20 of KCL. If you don't have much clinical experience yet, this may seem like quite a mouthful and a bit of a random collection of components. However, at least in the US, it's a very commonly used fluid that is so ubiquitous that it seems like it should have a shorter name by now, but unfortunately it doesn't. So what does this contain? 77 milliequivalents per liter of sodium, 97 milliequivalents per liter of chloride, 20 milliequivalents per liter of potassium, and 50 grams per liter of glucose. Notice the huge difference in glucose concentration between this fluid and plasma. There is no calcium or a buffer. Now the predicted osmolarity of this is about 446 milliosmoles per liter, from which you would guess that this is a hypertonic fluid. However, since the glucose is very rapidly taken up by cells, the effect it has on the body is actually that of a hypotonic fluid. As with plain half-normal saline, this is used solely as a maintenance fluid. Then D5W, which as I mentioned is electrolyte-free sugar water, the name D5W is short for 5% dextrose in water, where dextrose is just another name for glucose. So this is composed of 50 grams of glucose dissolved in one liter of water. The calculated osmolarity is 252, which already seems hypotonic. However, as with the D5 half normal saline plus 20 of K, the infused glucose is rapidly taken up by cells, making this an extremely hypotonic fluid. So much so that it's not even used as a maintenance fluid, since virtually none of it stays in the intravascular space. Instead, it is used solely in hypernatremia, in which one is trying to bring down plasma osmolarity, and in persistent hypoglycemia, such as that seen in sulfonylurea toxicity. Now, so far, you may have noticed that none of these fluids remotely comes close to approximating plasma. Well, for that, we have our final fluid, which is known as lactated ringers, abbreviated LR, in some parts of the world, and is known as Hartman solution in others. Confusingly, some sources claim these terms are fully interchangeable, while others claim that there are extremely small but real differences in the concentrations of electrolytes between the two, and some sources even list different electrolyte concentrations for just LR. 
For simplicity, I'll be referring to this fluid as lactated ringers or LR moving forward. Here are the most commonly cited numbers for LR's electrolytes. 130 milliequivalents per liter of sodium, 109 milliequivalents per liter of chloride, 4 of potassium, and 3 of calcium. There is no glucose unless you are using the uncommon fluid D5LR. Now the most interesting aspect of LR is the inclusion of the anionic metabolizable buffer lactate, which is present at a concentration of 28 milliequivalents per liter. The overall osmolarity of LR is 273 milliosmoles per liter, which makes this uh, isotonic fluid, and its major use is in resuscitation, with less frequent use as a maintenance fluid. Now we normally think of lactate in the plasma as being dangerous. It leads to an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis and is used as a marker for poor tissue perfusion and shock. So why would we intentionally add it? Well, lactate gets metabolized in a series of steps to bicarbonate, providing a buffer to help prevent the acid-base disturbances seen with rapid infusion of normal saline. LR was the first of the so-called balanced solutions which is a term used to describe any IV fluid that closely approximates the electrolyte concentrations of normal plasma. Some would argue that contemporary usage of the term balanced solution should no longer include LR, given that it does not resemble plasma after all, given its high lactate content and lack of magnesium. But there isn't a consensus on this, at least not for now. Likewise, LR has strong advocates and detractors, and a complete discussion of this debate is beyond the scope of this particular video, but will be discussed a little bit in the next one. Now, what are some of the downsides of certain crystalloid fluids? Aside from shifts in plasma sodium levels and plasma osmolarity that occurs with hypotonic and hypertonic fluids, there are a couple of other important problems of which you should be aware. The biggest of this comes with infusing large volumes of normal saline. It's not uncommon to end up causing a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis particularly if the normal saline is continued after restoration of normal intravascular volume. Some explain this as a so-called dilutional acidosis, in which the acidosis is caused literally by diluting the concentration of extracellular bicarbonate, while the concentration of CO2 remains the same. As with so much of the science of IV fluids, physicians and physiologists can't agree on that explanation either. For example, proponents of the Stewart model of acid-base balance cite a completely different mechanism. But irrespective of the mechanism, almost everyone agrees that this iatrogenic acidosis is typically mild in severity and of only modest clinical importance. In addition, there are some small problems with LR. Specifically, contraindications to LR include hyperkalemia. Now, admittedly, with only 4 milliequivalents per liter of potassium, you would need to give liters and liters of LR before causing a problem, but even if not dramatically harmful, it nonetheless feels inelegant. Also, there is a long-standing belief that concurrent blood transfusions should be avoided due to the calcium in the LR binding to the citrate used in blood products as an anticoagulant. A couple of recent studies have called this latter contraindication into question, but conventional practice is still to avoid the simultaneous administration of each. I'll now move on to colloids. Colloids can be divided into natural colloids, such as albumin and FFP, and synthetic colloids, such as dextrans, hydroxyethyl starch, and less commonly, gelatins. Volume expansion due to colloid is determined largely by its molecular weight and its concentration. Colloid fluids can be either saline-based solutions or balanced solutions. While they are typically only used for resuscitation in severe hypovolemia, there are a couple of exceptions to this. These include the use of albumin in cirrhotic patients when part of the treatment protocol for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and when the cirrhotic patient has renal failure of undetermined etiology, but in which decreased renal perfusion from hypovolemia is a possibility. When different colloids are compared, instead of comparing electrolyte concentrations, it's more common and useful to compare features such as the average molecular weight of the macromolecule, the oncotic pressure of the fluid, the initial volume expansion as a percentage of the volume infused, and the average duration of volume expansion. For example, for the commonly used colloid 5% albumin, or occasionally 4% albumin, the average molecular weight of the albumin is 69 kilodaltons. Its oncotic pressure is 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury, 
depending on whether you're using 4 or 5%. The initial volume expansion is approximately 70 to 100%, which means if 200 milliliters of low concentration albumin is infused, the plasma volume will increase by approximately 140 to 200 milliliters. Lastly, the duration of volume expansion is 12 to 24 hours. After that, the infused albumin molecules begin to leak through the capillary membrane into the interstitial fluid, and probably to some lesser extent, some of the albumin becomes uh, metabolized. This results in a delayed decline in intravascular volume. Another colloid is 20 to 25% albumin, or high concentration albumin. The average weight of albumin is unchanged since it's the same molecule, but the higher concentration results in higher oncotic pressure. The volume expansion here is closer to 300 to 500 percent, which is really extreme. That means if you were to infuse 200 milliliters of 25 percent albumin, not only would that 200 milliliters stay in the intravascular space, but the very high oncotic pressure would draw in up to an additional 800 milliliters from a combination of the interstitial and intracellular spaces. That might sound great if the only thing you are worried about is the intravascular volume, but decreasing the interstitial and intracellular volumes so quickly could be problematic if the patient is starting off hypovolemic to begin with. Therefore, 25% albumin should not be used for resuscitation of hypovolemic patients. Instead, common indications include giving during large volume paracentesis in order to prevent electrolyte abnormalities from abrupt fluid shifts, and as part of the treatment protocol for SBP, in which it's believed to prevent the development of hepatorenal syndrome. There's a group of colloids called dextrans, which are based on highly branched polysaccharide molecules that are produced by growing a specific bacteria in a sucrose medium. Naming convention for dextrans is based not just on their concentration as total mass per volume of solution, but also by the average molecular weight of the molecules measured in kilodaltons. So for example, 10% dextran 40 is composed of polysaccharide molecules of an average weight of 40 kilodaltons. Dextrans tend to contain an oncotic pressure in the neighborhood of and slightly greater than 5% albumin and convey a volume expansion of 100 to 200%. A potential downside to the dextrans compared with other colloids is a short duration of that volume expansion. The last colloid I'll discuss is hydroxyethyl starch. Hydroxyethyl starch is a derivative of amylopectin, which is a highly branched polymer of glucose found in plants and which structurally resembles glycogen. In order to stabilize and lengthen the half-life of amylopectin in plasma, there is a substitution of hydroxyethyl groups at some of the C2 and C6 positions. Different forms of hydroxyethyl starch are distinguished by different average molecular weights, different degree of hydroxyethyl substitution, and different ratios of substitution between the C2 and C6 positions. For example, I've circled the hydroxyethyl groups here. One of the most common hydroxyethyl starches is Hespan. It has a huge average molecular weight of 450 kilodaltons and conveys a similar oncotic pressure to 5% albumin and similar volume expansion to 10% dextran 40. Its duration of volume expansion is variable, ranging from 8 to 36 hours. Now these four colloid fluids are just a few representatives of this category. There are many, many different types of dextrans and many different types of hydroxyethyl starches, each of which has a unique set of characteristics. I'll talk more about the evidence for and against the use of colloids in the next IV fluids video, but let me quickly mention three major side effects specifically of the synthetic colloids. They are allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, coagulation abnormalities, specifically a tendency towards bleeding, and renal failure. These are significant toxicities, which in addition to their increased cost compared to crystalloid fluids, limit the use of colloids in routine clinical practice, and make crystalloids the default choice in most situations. That concludes this video on crystalloids and colloids. The next video in the IV fluid series will discuss the use of fluids in resuscitation.